London's an amazing city. It's a good place to live and a great city to visit. People from all over the world live in London and the city has over 14 million international visitors every year. So, what do visitors think of London? My name is Gabriel, I'm from Brazil. And I like London because it's a really interesting and fun city. My name is Andrea. I'm from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I love London because it's an old city. It's so interesting and there's lots to learn. Uh, my name is Wayne. I'm from the U.S. Uh, we're here on a vacation for about three weeks. Um, I love London. It's a beautiful city. So my name's Amber and I live in England and my aunt is here on vacation and we've come to London for a few days. My name's Peter, uh, I'm Canadian, I'm a student over here and I like London because it's international. There are over 200 museums and galleries in the city, and a lot of them are free. Visitors come from all over the world to see London's museums and galleries. My name is Bill, and I'm from the United States, from Hilton Head, South Carolina. I'm visiting London for the fifth time and there's always something to do in London. It has a great variety of culture and wonderful museums. Hi, my name is Helen. I come from China. I love London because all the museums are free. My name is Matt. I'm from Chicago. I'm a student in London and I love the British Museum because of the interesting things there. My name's Colleen. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. I'm here to see my friends. I love the Tate Modern because it's free. The Tate Modern is an art gallery. It's near the River Thames. It's a really big building and it has a lot of interesting modern art inside. There's a great view of the city from the restaurant. There's a lot to see and do in London. The city has a lot of beautiful old buildings. My name is Elizabeth, I'm from Australia and I love Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey, one of the world's great churches, is near Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament. The royal family live at Buckingham Palace. The palace is very big. Visitors like to watch the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace.
My name's Tess, I'm a chef, I'm from Australia and I'm here for the good food. Borough Market is near London Bridge. It's open four days a week and it's a great place to buy good food. Uh, hello, my name is Inês, I'm from France and I like the culture and the shopping in London. London's great for shopping. But some of the shops are very expensive. My name is Emilia. I am from Sweden. I live in London and I love London because of the different cultures, the music scene and the arts and going to the theatre. There are theatres all over London. London's very big and very busy, but it's easy to travel around the city. There are a lot of buses and taxis. There's the underground. and bicycles too. But driving a car in London is difficult. The traffic is really bad. Some people don't really like the city. My name's David, I live and work in London, but I don't like it here because it's very expensive and the weather's bad. My name is Carmel, I'm from Manchester. I'm here to see my sister. I think London is very big and very expensive. But a lot of people love London. My name's Anit and I come from Morocco and I love all of London. Uh, my name is Junior and um, I like, I'm from Southampton and I like London because it's busy and there's lots of people and the buildings are nice. I love it here in London. It is so beautiful. The buildings are so old. Uh, the people are very friendly. The culture, uh, it's just amazing here. It's half past seven in the morning in Brooklyn, New York. It's the start of another busy day for Alex. He gets up and makes some toast for breakfast. He eats his breakfast and checks his email. This is Alex's video diary. My name's Alex. I'm 35. I'm from Chicago, but now I live in Brooklyn. I'm a bike messenger in New York City, and my days are very busy. It's 8 o'clock. Time to go. He doesn't wear a uniform to work. 
He wears his own clothes. Alex fills his water bottle, and he's ready to leave home. He always carries a large bag and his cell phone. He lives in an apartment on the sixth floor. Luckily, there's an elevator. Alex's bike is outside his apartment. Before he starts work, Alex goes to a coffee shop. There are a lot of coffee shops in New York, but this is my favorite. The coffee is great and it's cheap too. Alex drinks his coffee and reads the newspaper. He starts work at half past eight. As a bike messenger, Alex collects and delivers small packages all over the city. Alex's day is very busy. There are a lot of packages to collect and deliver. There's a lot of traffic, but Alex doesn't stop. He is very fast. He knows all the streets of the city. Alex likes working outside when the weather is good. Today's a beautiful day in New York. At just after one o'clock, Alex has lunch. He sometimes buys pizza at a small takeaway restaurant. He eats his lunch in the park. I like eating outdoors when the weather is good. The park is beautiful. Time to go again. Alex works hard and he travels all over the city. He works for about 10 hours. At the end of the day, he delivers his last package and cycles home to Brooklyn.
Alex arrives home at about seven o'clock. I love my job, but at the end of the day, I'm always tired. In the evenings, I don't do much at all. When he arrives home, Alex has a shower. Then he cooks his dinner. Tonight, it's pasta and salad. Alex isn't married. His girlfriend lives in Chicago. He uses the internet to talk to her every evening. For a million bucks. Are you serious? Yes, very, very serious. Dookie. Bye. In his free time, Alex plays the guitar. He enjoys writing songs. Because he is tired, he goes to bed at about 11 o'clock, ready for another busy day tomorrow. Anna is a hairdresser. She cuts hair at a small hairdressing salon called Philosophy. Five hairdressers work at the salon with Hannah. They cut both women's and men's hair at Philosophy. Hannah enjoys her job as a hairdresser. I like my work. I like changing people's style. I usually work from nine till half past five. On a Thursday, I work from nine till seven. And on a Saturday, I work from nine till four o'clock. I don't work on Fridays or Sundays. Hannah doesn't drive, so she takes the bus to and from work. I live quite far from work. Sometimes it takes two hours on the bus to get to work. When she's not at work, she likes spending time with her family and friends. In my free time, I like to go shopping, relax, socialise with my friends, and I don't think about work. I think I have a good work-life balance. Is a paramedic. He works for the ambulance service. He works in a 999 medical emergency control centre and drives an ambulance car. In the control centre, he answers medical emergency calls. Sometimes people don't need an ambulance, they need medical advice. So Matt helps them. When he's in the ambulance car, he drives to emergencies and helps people. I love my job. I like helping people. I work many hours. I work days and night shifts. When I work a day shift, um, I normally work from 7am in the morning through to 7pm in the evening. And then when I work night shifts, it's generally from 7pm in the evening through to 7am in the morning. I sometimes work late when there's a 999 call at the end of my shift. Because he works long hours and studies part-time at university, Matt doesn't have much free time. I enjoy spending time with my family. 
I have two young children, Alexander and Ina, so I have to balance studying and my children. I don't have a good work-life balance. Um, I enjoy my job, it's just tiring and the night shifts mean that sometimes I'm very tired on my days off. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So we'll send over the family. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye. My name is Sally and I'm a cake decorator. I work in a shop and I decorate and finish birthday cakes, celebration cakes. Three cake decorators work in the cake shop with Sally. People come to the cake shop to buy cakes for birthdays, weddings or other special occasions. They don't bake the cakes in the shop, but they decorate them with amazing designs. People watch the cake decorators work I love my job. Um, every day is different. Every uh, order we have at, here at the shop is different, so uh, no day is ever the same. I work nine to five, uh, Monday to Friday. I don't work late. I leave for work at seven o'clock in the morning, and I travel by van into work, and it takes one hour, 20 minutes. When she's not at work, Sally is very busy. I enjoy gardening and cooking at home and uh, reading. You know, I just enjoy spending time with my family. Um, I like my job, I love my time at home, so I do have a good work-life balance. My name is Rob Palliser. Uh, I'm a florist and I work at Scott's Flowers in New York City. Scott's Flowers is a flower shop in Midtown Manhattan. The shop is very big and it's full of beautiful flowers. Rob's job is very busy. I make bouquets every day and I arrange flowers for all different kinds of parties, uh, birthday parties, weddings, and other kind of events. I talk with customers every day. Um, I also take orders on the phone every day, and I do deliveries. Being a florist is a fun job. I like it very much. Um, I like talking to people. Uh, I like using my hands, and I like being creative. Hello. Every day I wake up at 7 a.m., I take the train into the city, and I get to the flower shop at 9 a.m., and I leave every day at 5 p.m. When I'm not working, uh, I enjoy relaxing, watching TV, meeting new people, going out with my friends, and uh, I'm a DJ. 
I think it's difficult to have a good work-life balance. Um, I work a lot of hours, but when I am off, I enjoy my free time. When it's time for a holiday, it's great to visit a new place. And if you don't want to stay in a hotel, today it's very easy to find an amazing holiday home. And in Cornwall, in the southwest of England, there are a lot of holiday homes. And some of these holiday homes are quite unusual. This is Bedrifty in West Cornwall. 2,000 years ago, there was a village here. The old houses were round, so they are known as round houses. And today, you can stay a short walk from this old village here, at the Bedrifty Roundhouse. This roundhouse was built in 1999. It's the same size and shape as a roundhouse in the old village. It's 13 metres wide and 13.1 metres tall. Inside, there's only one room. There aren't any windows, but the roundhouse has electricity, so there are some lights. You can sleep in a comfortable wooden bed and there are some wooden benches and chairs to sit on. There's a fire in the middle of the room, so the roundhouse is quite warm. But there isn't a kitchen or a bathroom here. Luckily, very near the roundhouse is another building called the Lantern. Guests can use all the facilities at the Lantern. There's a small kitchen with a cooker, a toaster and a kettle. There's a table and two chairs where you can eat. There's also a small modern bathroom with a shower. The Bedrifty Roundhouse is an unusual but lovely place to stay. This is the Trelissic Water Tower, a very unusual holiday home near the beautiful River Fal in South Cornwall. The tower is over 150 years old and it became a home in the 1970s. It has three floors and one very narrow staircase with 49 steps. There's just one room on each floor. At the top, there's a nice kitchen. All the cupboards are the same round shape as the tower. There's a fridge, a cooker and a microwave. There's also a place to sit and eat. Downstairs, on the second floor, there's a very small living room with a comfortable sofa. There isn't a bookcase, but there are some books next to the window if you want to read. 
There's a TV and there are great views to the park outside. The bedroom is on the first floor. It isn't very big, but it's lovely. There are two bedside tables and there's a big mirror on the wall. Unfortunately, you need to go outside and through another door to use the bathroom. The Trelissic Water Tower is a fabulous place to stay for a holiday. Three kilometers from the beautiful beach of Senan Cove, there's another amazing holiday home. From the back, it's just a small green hill. But from the front, you can see that there's a fantastic house under the grass. This is the bunker. The bunker was first built in the 1940s. It was a safe place to work during the Second World War. There are two doors into the bunker. Inside, the large main room is a living room, a dining room and a kitchen. In the living room, there are two brown sofas and a coffee table. There's also a TV and a small bookcase full of books next to a brown armchair. There's a lamp on the bookcase, so you can read at night. The kitchen is very modern. There's a new kettle and a large cooker and microwave. It's a great place to cook. In the middle of the room, there's a table and six chairs. And near the table, there's a piano. There are four bedrooms in the bunker. Two of the bedrooms have big beds and their own bathrooms. With fabulous showers. There aren't any windows in the bunker. But there is sunlight from outside when you look up. You can see the skylights on top of the bunker. The bunker is in the middle of the countryside, so it's very quiet. In front of the bunker, there's a bench where you can sit and eat in the sun. So where do you want to stay on your holiday? In a hotel? In a roundhouse? In a tower? Or perhaps in a bunker? You decide. Manchester is a large city in the north of England. In the mid-19th century, Manchester was a rich and important industrial city. It was famous for its canals, railway, and cotton industry. Today, Manchester is still a busy and exciting city. But it's now more famous for its football teams. Right in the centre of Manchester, there's an unusual school with an amazing history. The school is called Cheatham's and all of its 295 students are very special. 
Cheatham's is the largest music school in the United Kingdom. And every student here can play a musical instrument brilliantly. Some of the Cheatham school buildings are over 600 years old. The first school opened here in the 1650s. At this time, there were only 40 students at the school. There weren't any girls and it wasn't a music school. But there was a library at this school. The library books were for the school's boys and for the people of Manchester. This was one of the first public libraries in the UK and you can still read the old books in the school library today. It's lunchtime at Cheatham School. Four students are playing a classical concert in the school hall. These students are 18 and they are in their last year at Cheatham's. Students can come to Cheatham's when they're eight years old. Students come from all over the world to study here. The director of music is Stephen Threlfall. We're looking for young musicians who can play an instrument, ideally can read music, and know something about musical language. The students study all the usual school subjects like maths, English and science, but they also study music for about three hours a day. All of the students at Cheatham's have a passion to succeed in music and the teachers can help them. A lot of teachers at Cheatham's were professional musicians before they came to the school. I can play the cello, uh, that's my main instrument, and I can play the piano. I can get by on the piano and I can play the guitar and of course I can sing. And one other thing I do do a lot of is I'm a conductor. So with great teachers and hard work, the students can be very successful. They often win national and international music competitions. One of Cheatham's most successful young musicians is Peter Moore. I'm Peter Moore, I'm 14 years old and I study music at Cheatham's. I play the trombone and in 2008 I won the BBC Young Musician of the Year competition, which was a fantastic experience and a real honour to win. Peter was only 12 years old when he won the BBC Young Musician of the Year competition. This is a very important national competition for musicians under 18. One of the competition judges was Nicola Benedetti. Peter comes from a very musical family. Music was very important when I was young. My parents were both professional musicians and I grew up listening to music all the time. My mum and dad were both horn players um, in orchestras and my brother plays the trumpet and my sister plays the piano. Peter was interested in music from a very young age. I first started to read music when I was about six years old. My dad started teaching me trombone when I was seven years old and I started playing the piano a year after that. 
Today, Peter lives in Manchester with his family, but he wasn't born here. I was born in Northern Ireland and moved over to Manchester when I was eight. I started at Cheatham's when I was nine in 2005. Life at Cheatham's can be hard work, but Peter enjoys it. And he doesn't play the trombone all the time. The best thing about being at Cheatham's is the musical opportunities that you get. At school, I can play in many different ensembles, orchestras, jazz bands, brass bands. I think my favourite is jazz band. When I'm not playing music, I like to relax and play sport like football or tennis. I support Manchester City Football Club and go to see the matches regularly when I have the time. Peter is young, but he is very talented and hardworking. And with the help of the teachers at Cheatham's and a lot of practice, he can become world famous in the future. Do you know what happened in the world the year you were born? I was born on the 20th of April 1964. That was in the middle of Beatlemania, when the British pop group The Beatles was really popular. My mum was a big Beatles fan. She had all their records, so I grew up listening to their music. I still listen to it sometimes. It's great. The four members of the Beatles were born in the city of Liverpool in the UK. In 1961, they played together in a small local club called the Cavern Club. Beatles fans still come to this club today. The Beatles made their first single, Love Me Do, in 1962. And by the end of 1963, they were the biggest band in the UK. They had thousands of very excited fans. In 1964, the band went on tour to the USA for the first time. They arrived in New York on the 7th of February. They only stayed for two weeks. But they made a lot of fans. The Beatles returned to the USA in August. And they had concerts in 23 cities. By the end of 1964, they were the biggest band in the world. Do you know what happened in the world the year you were born? I was born on the 11th of January, 1976. I think that was the year that Concorde started flying. My dad flew to New York on Concorde once, and he talked about it a lot. I remember there was a horrible crash in Paris about 20 years ago, and Concorde stopped flying after that. I saw one in the museum recently. It was an amazing plane. In 1969, British and French engineers flew an early model of the supersonic passenger jet Concorde. People were amazed by this beautiful new plane that could fly at over 2,000 kilometers an hour. 
In 1976, 14 Concorde planes were ready for passengers. They flew from London and Paris to New York. The journey only took three hours. But the tickets were very expensive. A lot of people didn't like the plane because it was very noisy. Concorde flew for nearly 30 years and its last flight was in 2003. Today, the journey from London to New York by plane takes seven hours. Do you know what happened in the world the year you were born? I was born on May the 7th, 1981. That was the year that Charles and Diana got married. My parents have photos of me as a baby at a street party for the wedding. It was a fairy tale story with a really sad ending. I remember when Princess Diana died in 1997. I was still at school. It was really sad. On the 24th of February 1981, 32-year-old Prince Charles and 20-year-old Lady Diana Spencer announced that they were getting married. Their wedding was on the 29th of July. It was a hot and sunny day and it was a national holiday in the UK. 600,000 people came to London to see Charles and Diana get married. The crowds of people were very excited to see the prince and his new wife, Princess Diana. People celebrated the wedding around the world. More than 750 million people watched it on TV. On the 21st of June 1982, Charles and Diana's first son, Prince William, was born. And on the 29th of April 2011, Prince William stood on the balcony at Buckingham Palace and waved to the crowds with his new wife, Kate. Do you know what happened in the world the year you were born? I was born on the 21st of March in 1994. That was the year that Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa. He was in prison for a long time before that. I think he was president for about five years. He also won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993. He was an incredible man. Nelson Mandela was born in South Africa in 1918. Mandela was a lawyer. He worked against his country's terrible laws. In 1964, the government sent him to prison for life. But the people of South Africa didn't forget him while he was in prison. He became a national and international hero. And finally, after 27 years, he became a free man again on the 11th of February, 1990. On the 10th of May, 1994, Nelson Mandela and his party, the African National Congress, 
won the first free elections in South Africa's history. And Mandela became the first black president of his country. Mandela died in 2013. But he is remembered around the world every year on his birthday, the 18th of July, Mandela Day. Uh, we got married in a church in Oxford. Uh, there were about a hundred people there and the ceremony took about an hour. I wore a long white wedding dress. My bridesmaids wore navy blue dresses um, and Stuart wore a black suit. After the ceremony, we went to a restaurant where we had a party with about 80 people. The party finished at about five o'clock um, and we left and went straight on our honeymoon. We went on honeymoon to Edinburgh. I met my husband in 2006. We both worked in the same hospital, but we met in a restaurant. When I got married, there were five different ceremonies over five days in two different cities, Manchester and London, and there were about 300 people at the wedding. I had three wedding cakes and we ate about six large meals. The first event was the registry wedding, where I wore a white dress and a tiara. And then after that, it was the Mendy ceremony, which is where the bride has henna applied to her hands and feet. The third event was the biggest, and that was the wedding ceremony, the wedding party itself. I wore a traditional Indian dress called a lenga, which is a embroidered top and an embroidered skirt with a very, very heavy scarf. I also wore heavy gold jewelry, um, 10 bangles and big earrings and a big necklace. My husband wore a traditional long top and trousers underneath embroidered with gold. And he also wore a hat called a turban, which was very heavy. We then went to Manchester for the fourth ceremony. Again, we ate a lot of food, we had another cake, and we enjoyed ourselves a lot. The final event, the fifth ceremony, was a small dinner with my husband's family and my family, and that was just as well because we were very, very tired by then. I don't celebrate my birthday much anymore. I might go out for dinner with some friends or my family, but I remember when I was a child, my parties were really, really exciting and I always looked forward to them. I remember my seventh birthday party was one of the best. It was an important birthday for me because it was the first birthday I had in Scotland because we moved from Canada to Scotland the year before. My birthday's in June, and I remember that it wasn't raining, and it always rained in Scotland. I invited four friends from school, and I remember we all wore our favourite dresses. Um, we ate snacks, like sandwiches and sausage rolls, and my mum made a chocolate cake, and I remember I blew out the candles. Afterwards, there were lots of activities, 
uh, we played games and danced a lot. Um, I remember having a, a really good time. Uh, recently it was my 40th birthday and I celebrated it um, with all my friends, which was brilliant. I decided to have a 1970s party, so lots of my friends dressed up in 1970s clothes. I wore a dress that was from 1970. I bought it in a retro market in Rome and it was long and orange and it had orange chiffon sleeves. We ate 1970s food, um, I played 1970s music, lots of disco and soul and that kind of thing. Uh, I had a cake, um, my sister arranged for somebody to make a cake and it uh, was a 1970s cake with big platform shoes on top and happy birthday Carolyn. Um, I think the party went really well, lots of people dressed up, uh, lots of people danced. I think everyone had a good time. The party wasn't on the actual day of my birthday, it was a couple of days before. On my birthday I was in Italy um, and I decided to bounce across the Ponte Vecchio in Florence on my 1970s space hopper to celebrate. When people think about British food, they often think about traditional food, like fish and chips. Or more unusual takeaway food, like Cornish pasties. Cornish pasties come from Cornwall, in the southwest of England. The pasty is usually made with some potatoes, vegetables and meat, baked inside pastry. But international food is popular in Britain too. There are a lot of restaurants, markets and festivals where you can try delicious food from all around the world. How about trying some Jamaican jerk chicken with some rice and peas? So what food do you love or hate? I like French food. I also like Thai food. Well, I like Chinese food, and I think you like Chinese food yeah, too. Yeah, I like Chinese food. My favourite food is Indian. I really don't like peas. I like Japanese food. Uh, I like Italian food, like uh, pizzas and pastas. My favourite food um, is jacket potato with um, chilli con carne. <laughs> I don't like cereal. This is the Cowley Road in Oxford. Cowley Road isn't a big street, but it's often very busy. There are a lot of cars and buses. But if you'd like to try some new and exciting international food, it's a great place to go. On this one street, you can find food from China, the Middle East, Italy, Poland, Greece, Jamaica, or Russia. And if you prefer to cook at home, there are also food shops where you can buy the ingredients to cook recipes from around the world. There are also a lot of Indian restaurants on the Cowley Road. Although they are called Indian restaurants, they often serve food from India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. 
They're also known as curry houses. Curry is one of the most popular dishes in the UK. The Majlis restaurant is one of the curry houses on the Cowley Road. The kitchen is small and busy. It's nearly lunchtime. The three chefs prepare many different dishes for the lunchtime menu. They cook traditional Bangladeshi and Indian food. There are fresh vegetables and spices in all the dishes. There's a lot of chicken and fish in Bangladeshi food. There's some lamb too, but there isn't any pork. The chef prepares a curry with chicken and prawns. He prepares and fries some very large prawns. He cooks some chicken in a special oven called a tandoor. When the chicken is cooked, he chops it into small pieces. The chef fries some onions and some chilli in a large frying pan. Then he adds some spices. There are a lot of different spices in the dish. The chef doesn't need a recipe. He knows which spices to use. He adds the chopped chicken to the frying pan. He mixes all the ingredients together. Then he adds the cooked prawns. The dish is nearly ready, but there's a lot more food to cook. The chef makes naan bread. He cooks the bread in the tandoor. People usually have some naan bread and rice with their curry. Finally, all the dishes are ready. There's a lot of food. It all looks amazing. Living in a big city can be a great experience. Some of the world's biggest cities, like Beijing in China and Delhi in India, are exciting places to live and to visit. These cities have got huge populations, many beautiful historic buildings. And some interesting modern architecture too. But like many big cities, 
they are very crowded and they've got problems with traffic and pollution. People didn't think about cars when they built them. Other cities, like Copenhagen, the capital city of Denmark, and Auckland, on the North Island of New Zealand, are much smaller. And they are famous for being great places to live with a very high quality of life. These cities are clean and safe, but they are also very expensive. Whether they are big or small, cities can be amazing places to live and visit. Which kind of city do you prefer? Paris, the capital city of France, is in the north of the country, on the River Seine. With a population of around 2.2 million, Paris is the largest city in France. It is also one of the most popular cities in the world for tourists. Around 22 million visitors come to the city every year. The best time to visit Paris is in the summer. The city can get very crowded, but generally it isn't too hot. The average summer temperature is only 25 degrees Celsius. Paris is famous for its cafes, its fashion and its amazing architecture and it's easy to see why people want to visit this beautiful and historic city. This is the Musée d'Orsay on the left bank of the River Seine. When this building opened in 1900 it was a busy train station Today, it is a very important art museum and it has sculptures and paintings by famous artists like Van Gogh, Monet and Renoir. While there aren't any skyscrapers in the centre of Paris, it has got one of the most famous tall structures in the world the 324-metre Eiffel Tower. The tower opened in 1889. It took just over two years to build. And for over 40 years, it was the tallest structure in the world. Today, it's the busiest tourist attraction in the city with more than 7 million visitors every year. You can climb to the top, but there are 1,665 stairs. So most people take the lift. And you can get the best views of this wonderful city from the top. Five thousand kilometers from Paris, in the United Arab Emirates, is the city of Dubai. It's the biggest city in the region, and it's got a population of around 2.9 million. The city is on the Dubai Creek which is always busy with water taxis full of local residents and some of the three million tourists who visit the city every year. There are old parts of the city, 
But today, Dubai is most famous as a modern city full of skyscrapers. There are already 18 buildings over 300 meters tall in the city center. Tourists come here to see the Burj Al Arab, the world's most luxurious hotel. It's got 202 bedrooms, and the most expensive room is over $24,000 a night. Dubai is also famous for having one of the world's tallest structures. The 828 meter tall Burj Khalifa. It's got 211 floors and over 24,000 windows. But in the summer, it is far too hot to spend time outdoors. Looking at the fantastic modern architecture of Dubai, the average temperature in July is 44 degrees Celsius. So, the most popular attractions in the city are indoors, where the temperature is much cooler. And the biggest attraction of all is the Dubai Mall. The Dubai Mall is one of the largest shopping centers in the world. It has got over 1,200 shops and 750,000 people visit the mall every week. Shops sell everything, from expensive clothes and jewelry to electronics. But there's also a lot to do and see for visitors who don't want to shop. Inside the mall are 22 cinema screens, a beautiful aquarium, and even an Olympic-sized ice rink, which is definitely the coolest place in this spectacular modern city. zone is an area of the world where they use the same time. Different time zones exist because the Earth is constantly turning. You travel across time zones as you move east to west or west to east around the globe. Some countries, like Portugal or Egypt, have only one time zone. But larger countries, like Russia or Canada, can have many time zones. The USA has six. When it is 9 a.m. in Los Angeles, on the West Coast, it is already 12 p.m. in Miami, on the East Coast. But countries thousands of kilometers apart, north to south, can still be in the same time zone. When it's 9 a.m. and it's snowing in Finland up north, it's also 9 a.m. more than 10,000 kilometers down south in South Africa. And it definitely isn't snowing. It's the middle of summer. The sun is shining and people are enjoying a day out at the beach. It's a busy world. And at any point in time, people around the globe are doing a million different things. Yeah. 
a.m. in New York. Jack is making breakfast. This morning, he is cooking eggs. Jack works as a tour guide in Manhattan. He gets the subway into the city early in the morning. Although it's early, many people in New York are already working hard. Krikor and Rocio are working in a small cafe. They are preparing food and making coffee for their customers. Everyone needs a good coffee to start their day. It's 8 a.m. in Buenos Aires, Argentina. The Mena family are having another busy morning. Gabriela works in an office in the center of town. She leaves for work at 6.30 every morning. Her husband, Roberto, is a journalist. He doesn't start work until 9 a.m., so he's at home. He's helping his daughters, 11-year-old Milagros and 7-year-old Julieta, get ready for school. They are a bit late, so Roberto is driving the girls to school. After he says goodbye to his daughters, Roberto is going to his office to start work. It's 11 a.m. in Oxford in the UK. And police officer Marcus Gerber is working in the city. He's wearing his uniform. He's wearing dark blue trousers, a black shirt, a bright yellow jacket and a black hat. He is walking around the city to make sure the streets are safe and he's giving directions to visitors. It's 2 p.m. in Istanbul, Turkey. It's a hot and sunny day, and the city is full of tourists. The visitors are traveling around the city on the old trams and taking boat trips across the Bosphorus Strait. They are exploring the many beautiful buildings in the city and taking lots of photos. The markets are very busy. In the Grand Bazaar, tourists are buying colorful souvenirs to take home with them. It's 8 p.m. on the island of Okinawa in Japan. 93-year-old Hana Miyagi is spending time with her family. They are relaxing after dinner and watching TV. The people on Okinawa live very long lives. They eat healthy diets and they live on Okinawa time. This means that on Okinawa, time isn't important so there's very little stress in their lives. <laughs> 380 kilometers above the Earth, the International Space Station, or ISS, is traveling around the globe at over 32,000 kilometers an hour. 
While they are living on the ISS, the crew of six international scientists see a sunrise and sunset every 90 minutes. Scientists made the decision to use Greenwich Mean Time, GMT, in space. So it's the same time on the ISS as it is in Greenwich, London, 11 a.m. The crew are very busy this morning. They are all doing very important scientific experiments and looking after the space station. But there's always time to look out of the window and think about how the people on Earth, so far below, are spending their day. It's an October morning in North London. A group of friends are very busy. They're planning a route from Perth in Western Australia to Auckland in New Zealand. But they aren't going to travel by car, van or bus. They are going to drive a big red fire engine called Martha. They are all part of an amazing charity expedition called Follow That Fire Engine. Amy is one of the crew members. So um, Follow That Fire Engine is a charity expedition. We're driving a fire engine around the world to raise money um, for charity. It's going to take nine months. Um, it's 26,000 miles, 28 countries um, and three charities. There are 25 people in the crew. Um, at any one time, there can be five people in the fire engine. Um, Steve is driving for the whole nine months. Um, some people are driving, going out for two weeks some people three months, and I'm going out for five months to drive the fire engine. So why are they going to drive a fire engine around the world? <laughs> Just over a year ago, Steve's father, Garth, died. Garth was a firefighter for 33 years, and Steve, his brother, and their friends wanted to do something to remember him. They could come from Barry Island. Cool. There we go, see? Ben is a friend of Steve's and a member of the Follow That Fire Engine crew. Um, we decided to drive a fire engine around the world to raise money for three charities, um, UK charities, and also to, um, to do something in Garth's memory because he was a very, very special person and he was also uh, a leading firefighter for our fire station in our hometown. There are eight stages in their journey around the world. I was, I was very lucky in a way because I was, um, I was on stage one and stage one left London on July, Sunday, July the 18th um, and then for two weeks we drove the fire engine from London through Europe and finally finished in Moscow in Russia on the 1st of August. I think we travelled through 16 countries in 14 days. Um, which was quite, it was quite an achievement. I'm very excited because I'm going to be joining the fire engine again uh, on stage seven of the expedition in January next year. Um, I'm going to be joining or arriving at a place called Grays Harbour uh, in North America, which is approximately 100 miles from the Canadian border. I am going to be travelling from Grays Harbour in North America 
down the west coast of America through cities such as Las Vegas, through San Francisco, um, through Los Angeles and California. And I'm going to be traveling through the Mexican border and finishing in Hermosillo. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting to San Francisco because I think driving the fire engine across the Golden Gate Bridge will be pretty amazing. But there's a long way to go before the fire engine arrives in North America in January. And Amy is the next driver leaving the UK to join Steve. I am going to fly to Perth in Western Australia in two weeks time um, and I'm going to drive the fire engine across Australia to Brisbane. We're then going to put the fire engine on a ship and go with the fire engine on the ship to New Zealand. There's a lot to do before Amy leaves for Australia and packing for a five-month trip isn't easy. So I'm going to leave England in the winter, where it's cold, um, and arrive in Australia in their summer. Um, where it's going to be about 40 degrees, so it's going to be really hot. I'm going to miss my bed, um, I'm going to miss home-cooked food, um, I'm going to miss my family, my mum and dad, because I speak to them every day. The expedition is going to take nine months and we are going to arrive back in the UK at the end of March and we're going to have a big welcome home party for the crew. The crew are going to have an amazing time on their journey around the world and with the help of everyone they meet they are also going to collect over £100,000 for charity, remember Garth and help a lot of people. I've lived in Germany before. I lived in Frankfurt for a year. I really like Germany because the people are really kind, the food's good and the culture is really interesting. Well, I've lived and worked in Germany and Portugal and the UK. Um, I lived in Germany for three years and I met my husband there and I met him in 2002 and we got married in 2004 and then we decided to go and live in Portugal for a year and after that in 2005 we came back to the UK. I lived in Australia in Melbourne for 10 months. Um, I liked Melbourne because the city was easy to get around. I liked the lifestyle and the culture. I've lived in Canada, Scotland and England. I was born in Ontario in Canada and when I was six we moved to Glasgow in Scotland and when I was nine we moved down to London. I'm in a band and uh, we have played festivals all over the world uh, in Japan, Europe and America. We went to Japan in April and uh, we played uh, four or five gigs and uh, the last gig was a festival in Sendai um, and there were thousands of people there. Uh, it was a really great experience, loved it. I've been backstage at a very big music festival called Download and it's where lots of heavy metal bands play their music to a large crowd of people. My friend is in one of those bands and he invited me to come along. I stood backstage with them and I filmed them playing on my mobile phone and it was really loud. Hi man, on, on the stage, download, look at that, mad.
I've scuba dived about 20 times. Um, I've scuba dived in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, and in Egypt, in the Red Sea. And I really enjoyed Egypt. Um, there was lots of nice fish to see, lots of interesting coral. Uh, the water was warm and uh, it wasn't too busy. I've travelled around Africa with two close friends. It was about three years ago. We went to Zimbabwe first. It was really good, but it was quite dangerous when we went there. My favourite part of the trip was an elephant ride in Botswana. I've tried bungee jumping. I did it when I was in South Africa, travelling. It was very frightening but exciting at the same time. The feeling's difficult to describe, but it was an amazing experience. I've eaten crocodile tail. Uh, It was at a hotel in Zimbabwe when I was 12. And it was kind of like fish mixed with chicken. It was weird. I have eaten camel. Um, it was at Ayers Rock in Australia and I was on a, a trip and we cooked a, a camel curry. The strangest thing I've ever eaten is sheep's brains. Um, I ate them when I was in Marrakesh in Morocco and they were very oily and they didn't taste very nice. I haven't eaten many strange things. Um, I've eaten mussels, which I think look really strange. <laughs> but I didn't like them at all. I have worked in some amazing places. I worked for a short time in Canada where the daytime temperature reached minus 30. Um, At night, nobody went out. Um, I have spent time in Antarctica on a research ship where the nighttime temperatures were greater than minus 40 centigrade and the daytime temperatures were minus 39. Um, I've worked as a volunteer um, in schools in India and Nepal. We taught drama um, and we weren't paid but we worked for six weeks. We visited about six different places. Um, We went to Delhi, Varanasi, Lucknow, Kathmandu, and um, Bakshi Karta Lab. Um, We worked with street children in Delhi. Um, They have really difficult lives, but after doing the drama, lessons they were really happy and it was really nice to see that. I have flown many times but I am very scared of flying. My husband has booked tickets to Prague three times. Each time I have made it to the airport but not onto the aeroplane. I have tried a fear of flying course. I've been to the doctor but nothing can help. I have never been to a music festival. I live in a town called Reading and there is a very famous music festival there every year. But strangely, I have never been to that festival. I've never been to Russia. Um, I want to take the train, I want to take the Trans-Siberian Express across Russia to Mongolia and China. And I want to go to Red Square and see the Kremlin. And I want to go to St. Petersburg to see all the art treasures. I play ice hockey for a local team. We've played all over the UK, but we've never played in North America. The best teams are in the United States and Canada, and one day I want to play there. I'm a vegan, so I don't eat meat or fish. I've never eaten meat or fish, so I don't know what it tastes like. I've just failed my driving test. I took 40 lessons before the test, but I still failed. (laughs) I've never scuba dived in Thailand, um, but I've heard from other people that it's a really nice place to dive. Uh, There's lots of nice fish to see again, and the waters are nice and clear. Thank you for watching this video. Keep on practicing your English. See you next time.